Hey everybody, this is Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Thanks for joining me for another episode of ATP Ask the Pastor. Today's question is... Hello, Pastor. I love your channel and your video entitled Trinitarian Baptism or Baptism in the Name of Jesus. You referenced the Didache. I have a two-part question on the Didache. How should Christians treat texts like this one? That is to say, texts that are verified historical documents uh, that supplement Scripture, do not contradict Scripture, but are not Scripture breathed out from God. The other question is, if you're willing to speculate, what could some of the reasons be as to why the Didache was not included in the canon? Yeah, this will be fun. Uh, early church history is a growing uh, a growing interest of mine here. Before we inter answer your question on uh, how do we approach texts like the Didache, uh, how do we treat them, how do we deal with them, uh, let me first explain what the Didache is for our viewers who are unfamiliar with it. The Didache is uh, a work from the late 1st century or very early 2nd century. Uh, Didache is Greek, it simply means teaching. The full title of the work is uh, The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. This is a work that, uh, until 1873, we only knew about it uh, through the writings of Eusebius of Caesarea. He mentions it uh, in his Ecclesiastical History, Book 3, and then uh, Athanasius of Alexandria also mentions the teaching of the Twelve Apostles in his 39th Festal Letter. We'll take a look at those here uh, by the end of this episode here. Uh, but this is something that we'd only heard about through those early church writers until 1873 uh, when someone in Constantinople discovered a codex that contained, among its many documents, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles then. Uh, what it is then, as far as content goes, it is uh, a church manual, to, to, say, uh, to say the least. Uh, it can be broken up into two distinct parts. Chapters 1 through 5 are, are a morality catechism. It's a, uh, this is how a Christian ought to live. Uh, and then chapters uh, 6 uh, through the end, uh, those are then uh, more more of your church order, and we'll unpack this more then. So uh, the first section, this this uh, moral catechism presents two ways. There's a way of life and a way of death. It's very similar to, uh, it's not the same as, but it's similar to the way that Solomon um, puts together the first chapters of the book of Proverbs, where he says, you can live your life either according to uh, lady wisdom or Dame Folly. So in the Didache, it's, uh, you can either walk the path of life or the path of death. Then, uh, Now, this is very similar, and, and this, is, this is kind of where things get interesting with the Didache. Is the first five chapters of the Didache are also found in two other contemporary documents. One of them is the Apostolic Constitutions, which uh, dates a little bit after uh, this time period, probably late 2nd century. Uh, mid to late 2nd century. The other one is the Epistle of Barnabas, which is either slightly earlier than the Didache or a contemporary. I think it's probably a contemporary. Uh, but all three of those sources have this, uh, this uh, document of the two ways. Now, all three are different to some degree, uh, and, and some scholars are going to say maybe they have the same source. Maybe one of those documents is the source. Uh, the important thing for our purposes is just simply to say that um, this this catechism of morality, these two ways, uh, they exist elsewhere in the literature of the apostolic fathers of this first uh, first and second century. Then, so uh, we really won't know which of those came first until we find more copies, and maybe that will never happen. It's one of those. Eh, if it happens, great. If not, you know, it's fine. Uh, now, the content of the first five chapters uh, is just straightforward moral exhortation, but. There are several really interesting nuggets, or at least things that I find interesting in there. So, for instance, uh, in chapter 2, verse 2, Thou shalt not murder a child by abortion, nor kill that which is begotten. So that's interesting that from its beginnings, uh, the, the church has a very early witness here that abortion is, in fact, a violation of the commandment, Thou shalt not kill. Uh, so he says the way of, of life does not uh, include uh, killing your babies, e either in the womb or after they've been born. So no abortion, no infanticide then. Uh, another gem is in uh, chapter 3, verse 8. It says, The workings that befall thee receive as good, knowing that apart from God, nothing comes to pass. So uh, in an age in which um, everyone imagines that God can give them bad things, and that's kind of the tendency of the sinful flesh anyway, <coughs> excuse me, 
And this is a good reminder that no, God only gives you good things. Um, and that even when they seem evil to us, uh, that's still ultimately for our good. Uh, let's see, another nugget in chapter 4, it teaches some reverence towards God and repentance, especially uh, in church. It says, uh, In the church thou shalt acknowledge thy transgressions, and thou shalt not come near for thy prayer with an evil conscience. So it's prioritizing confession, uh, contrition, and repentance, forgiveness of sins. Uh, there's also something that only someone like I would find interesting, only like someone like me would find interesting, uh, the Didache actually quotes the book of Tobit in the very first chapter, verse 2, and he says, All things uh, whatsoever thou wouldst uh, should not occur to thee, thou also to another do not do. So it, it's the golden rule inverted, uh, and that's from Tobit uh, chapter 4. Uh, so that's the first section, is this moral catechism of the way of life and the way of death. The second half of the Didache is equally as interesting because it's then a church manual and, and uh, is a demonstration of uh, church practices, either from the late 1st century or early 2nd century. Uh, so as you mentioned in your question, there's the reference to uh, baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost in chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, in chapter 8, verse 2, uh, we have the first appearance historically, at least the first appearance that I'm aware of, of a doxological ending attached to the Lord's Prayer, although it's not the complete one that we have today. Uh, 8 verse 2 says, uh, For thine is the power and the glory forever. So that's where, at least as far as I know, that's the first instance of that. It also speaks about how to celebrate the Lord's Supper, has some Eucharistic prayers. Uh, it later on in chapter 11 deals with itinerant preachers and prophets, how to tell whether a prophet is genuine or not. Um, and then in chapter 15, it then talks about the regular clergy, uh, the bishops and deacons, as St. Paul outlined to, uh, to Timothy and to Titus, rather in 1 Timothy in the book of Titus, um, and urging that you give them just as much honor as you give to these itinerant preachers, etc. Uh, and all of that has to do with what scholars think uh, as far as the date of this goes. That, that, that's more uh, kind of its own Bible study. Uh, so, the, but to your question, though, about all this, that, that's enough about the Didache. Uh, your question, how do we treat texts like the Didache? How do we approach texts like this that aren't Scripture but witness to Scripture? Well, I think the simplest answer is we treat them for what they are. Uh, you know, like you said, it, this isn't Holy Scripture. Uh, and other than the title, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, there's nothing in the text that claims any apostolic authorship. So if you, if you stripped off the title, uh, which many documents uh, didn't really have titles, then uh, you wouldn't necessarily say, okay, this was written by an apostle. So there's no what we call internal evidence for apostolic authorship of that. Uh, if it was written by an apostle, it would have been far better preserved and it would have been used in the churches on a much wider scale than it was. Uh, we know that it was used to some degree in uh, the vicinity of Alexandria, Egypt, uh, but we know that it was not read as scripture. Uh, Athanasius tells us that. I think what we do with works like the Didache is we treat them simply as witnesses uh, to the apostolic doctrine that is taught in Scripture. And so the Didache then gives us insights into the struggles of the early church uh, and also then their practices. I think it provides an interesting link between the New Testament and then the, the, the age of the apostolic fathers. Then That's really what we can do with it and how we can treat it. We ought not to make more of it than it really is then. Uh, now, as far as speculating, as far as why the Didache wasn't included in the canon, it seems that everyone in the early church, uh, at least by the time you get to the early 4th century, so uh, the early 400s, I'm sorry, early 300s, whew, been a long day already, early 300s, uh, everyone understood that this wasn't canonical. So we mentioned Eusebius of Caesarea at the beginning uh, in his Ecclesiastical History, Book 3, Chapter 25. He lists the teaching of the Twelve Apostles as one of the rejected books. Uh, Athanasius of Alexandria, in his 39th festival letter, uh, mentions the Didache and calls it apocryphal, then, along with the shepherd of Hermas. So the church simply didn't recognize these books as belonging to the canon, as being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, I think part of that is due to its composite nature, uh, having its uh, relationship to either the uh, to Barnabas, the epistle of Barnabas, um, and then also, like we said, it doesn't have any sort of real apostolic attestation to it. Uh, so that's, I think, why the church has never really viewed it. Um, it's never presented itself as something 
that is canonical and breathed out by the Holy Spirit. It is an interesting read. Uh, it is an interesting witness to the Christian faith and practice in early Christianity. And for that reason, I would recommend it. Uh, yeah, shows us the continuity of the Christian faith uh, from the New Testament into the early church period. So it's a good read. It's a short read. I'd highly recommend it. Thanks for your question. We will see you next time on ATP Ask the Pastor.